Okay, so I'm supposed to present the data assimilation uh, part. So it's going to be about the concept. It's going to be a little bit bumpy sometimes, you, do, you know, with some uh, with some pro conditional probabilities. I'm not asking you to understand everything behind it. I know you know some of you are not mathematicians, but see, the idea is to put some order behind all these uh, data assimilation methods and give you the basics. So later on. If you see a product of data assimilation of, or you work on, you know how to interpret the results and uh, you know, make sense of the results you're getting. Okay? Uh, so usually, I know it's 5 p.m., so you are all sleeping. So, and I usually I get more questions about my universities and my talks or presentations. So now I start with a few slides about where I come from. I come uh, from a university, it's called KAUST, it's on the Red Sea. And it's a campus, gated campus, and we have everything inside. So this is a community, and this is the university, and this is the Red Sea. My house is just here. This one here, exactly. It takes me 20 minutes to walk from here to the office. And here how it looks like in reality. So this is the campus, and this is the community around it. Uh, quick facts, I have two slides. We are more than 1,000 students now, it's only graduate university research, 100, more than 150 faculty, and our people come from more than 100 uh, uh, nationality. In terms of students, 80%, around 80% PhDs, male 60%, female. We're very proud of this number, we are in Saudi and it's a technical scientific science university, so 40% is quite good. And in terms of students, we have 70% from outside Saudi and 30% uh, Saudis. And we have very good facilities, we mainly use this. The supercomputing is quarter million uh, cores and we make very heavily use of this wonderful machine to run very large ensembles and I will show you an example of this uh, later on. Okay, so let's go to the serious things now. So here's the outline of the three sessions I'll be giving. I'll start with a brief introduction, probably, you know, just to introduce what is the assimilation problem and what are the issues with it. Then I will go to the 3D assimilation part. 3D assimilation is that there is no time component. You have a data now, and I want to estimate the state of the ocean now. Okay, so I'll talk about the least square formulation, and then this is what interests me. This is why I have to go through the Bayesian, uh, the uh, conditional probabilities. I will talk about the Bayesian formulation because based on this, I'll derive all the rest and you'll see, you know, all the approximations we make to resolve the holy picture of the Bayesian data assimilation uh, problem. So today I will do the 3D assimilation and also I'm hoping I'll be able to do very quickly the 4D VAR problem. You had two talks already mentioned, I think, 4D VAR. So it would be easy for me to introduce it, but I'll try to introduce it from a Bayesian point of view so that when I talk about the filtering, you will see the difference between 4D VAR and filtering and where all they come from, okay? Okay, so the introduction part. So I'm sure you know these things already, but data assimilation is about, you know, we want to estimate the state of the ocean at, a, at some time, so we want to use all the information, possible available information, to make the best possible. The word optimal, you know, some people say the optimal estimate, I'm very sensitive to it. Nothing we do is optimal, you know, it's best possible is a much better description uh, of six and, uh, things. And the way I see it is that, you know, the, the model dynamics uh, extrapolate the data, the data are sparse. So that the model dynamics extrapolate the data in space and in time to project back, uh, for, uh, b forward and backward. And the data is just guiding the model where to go. It's like a GPS and you're driving a car. And every time the data come and tell it the model, you know, you're going in the wrong direction, go back to the right direction. Okay, so this is basically assimilation. is about use everything we know and to make the best possible estimate of the state. So the uh, information, we have observations, I, I said sparse, model dynamics, and also any prior information you know would be useful. And so, the, in the ocean, the problem started after you know the big advances that has uh, that happened in the uh, the weather uh, community, and it was formulated as a initial condition or state estimation uh, 
problem. I'll talk later on about parameters estimation as, as well in the third session. Okay, so quick example. This is an example in the uh, in the Gulf of uh, uh, Mexico. Uh, BP came to us before the horizon uh, accident, and they wanted to predict the evolution of the loop current here uh, back when I was at Scripps. And the evolution as a loop current is just this current coming from South America turning and forming the Gulf Stream. They care about the front of the loop current because they have very strong velocities. When they hit, by, they are hit by the by these currents, they cannot drill and they lose a lot of money. And here is how the, the loop current, you know, an evolution of the loop current from the Aviso uh, interpolated uh, product. So sometimes there is an eddy, it sheds and starts moving around, and they want to see the front of this uh, loop current and if you can predict it uh, in time. <coughs> so, so what information we have for such a problem? We have the dynamics and you had all last week talking about dynamics. So this is, this I'm just listing to show you the complexity of dynamical models we deal with. So these are the Navier-Stokes equations and the tracer equations for the temperature salinity. And we put all these together. And from this, we discretize, we put it on a supercomputer and we run it. And this is a dynamical model we deal with, okay? So when we take this model, we put forcing from the atmosphere, we put some boundaries, and we run it, we get, this is, I think it was a uh, average field, I don't remember for which month, and we compared it to Aviso, we get the large scale, uh, scale picture, more or less okay, but, uh, you know, if you care really about the loop current, you know, the front is missed. And so, you know, the model alone, when we we do it without any data to constrain it, it it needs some help. So what we do is we use we try to use the data to improve this one. So the way we model it, we know that the model is not perfect when we compare the data. So we have this is a model. It allows me to go from a state now to state tomorrow with some error. I'm assuming there are some error. Now the state in the, of the ocean, we make a whole state vector and we put velocities, all the, all the variables that you need to initialize the model, the uh, prognostic variables. So typically, there are velocity, salinity, temperature, and sea sur surface height. This is how we model it, and I'm sure you s you've seen this already. And then these are, you know, you don't get all this data every, every week or every three days. These are, I put all the data we get from the uh, satellite over six months, just to show you an example of the data. Over, over three days, you get very few uh, tracks. And we model the observations as, you know, as a, as a function of the uh, ocean state. So the observation is observing some subset or combination of these uh, variable. For instance, if I'm observing the sea surface height, you will have H, it will become a matrix, with zero, 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 and some ones were along the tracks of the ocean. So basically, this is what we have. We have a model, dynamical model, and we have data that providing uh, information in time, and the question is, what's X? We call this, if you go to the uh, electrical engineering community, they call it uh, state space modeling. Okay? So this is my problem, and I'm looking for X. So there are two ways to look, two, two formulations, two approaches to uh, formulate this problem. There is a deterministic way, it's a least square sense, it's an inverse problem. Uh, so basically, I'm looking for the state that gets me as close, the ocean state that gets me as close as possible to the observation under some constraints. I'll get to that later. And there is the stochastic formulation where we are where we resort to random uh, formulations, so assume that the variables we want to estimate is random. Since it's random, it's characterized by its probability distribution. Once I get the probability distribution, I make an estimate on the probability distribution. Okay? And there are two ways you will see to deal with this Bayesian formulation. We do filtering, where we, we only take the data up to the estimation now. So I want to estimate now. I only take the data from the beginning till now. Or I do smoothing where I can take all the data at the same time, so I can use future data. So filtering is more in line with a forecasting system because 
I can use the data up to now to make the best estimate now, and then I forecast later on. I don't know the future yet. Uh, before we get there, just to give you an idea why we do all these approximations to, uh, to solve a data science problem, we deal with complex dynamics and numerics, really complex models. They are multi-scales, different scales in the ocean, from large to very small scales. There are multi-physics, competition, if this is very important, competitions are very expensive. Running one model can be very expensive de depending on the resolution you're dealing with. The higher resolution, the more we're seeing nonlinearities, eddies, uh, filaments, and also it's chaotic. It's not as chaotic as the atmosphere, but it's also chaotic in the sense a small error can propagate very quickly. So if you have an error at initial time, it can uh, grow. Okay, uh, the other thing, you know, problems that issues that we have to deal with is that there are a lot many sources of uncertainties in the system, and unfortunately, we don't know very well the statistics of these uh, uncertainties. And this is one of the main issues, in my opinion, uh, in data assignation. So there are uh, uncertainties from omitted physics, from parameterizations. We don't know very well the parameters. Uh, the inputs, like the atmospheric forcing, there are errors, numerical errors, just name it, errors in the observations. And we have somehow to make sense of these errors and account for them uh, during assimilation. And finally, a big problem is the dimension. We deal with very, very large dimensions. So, you know, we have dimension of 10 to the 9. So if you have a vector of 10 to the 9 dimension, if you take a covariance of it, it's 10 to the 9, 10, 10 to the 9. Forget it, you know, there is no machine that can handle these kind of dimensions. I close this with just this quick slide about if you've been hearing about UQ and certain quantification, about inverse, about data assimilation. They are more or less targeting the same uh, problems. Yes, they are very related uh, fields. You know, we look at assimilation as an inverse problem with the time component. Okay, there are data coming in time. Inverse is a problem. Is an assimilation problem where basically the time is hidden. You know, it's it comes mainly from the uh, geoscience people where they observe and they avert for some properties in the Earth. But both of them, they can be formulated in a very uh, close way. Actually, very 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 related. And lately, in the, in the, uh, in the last uh, decade, there was the, this UQ, a certain quantification community that became, uh, it's a very popular field now in mechanical engineer, and it's spreading around the, instead of looking for the state, they mainly interested in the parameters. And they do Bayesian inversion is, uh, of the parameters. And it's becoming also very popular. So these three fields are very similar. It depends how you're formulating the problem mainly interested in parameters, mainly interested in the state where data keep coming in, or you are interested in just one inversion and look for a uh, solution. So later on, I will talk about the uh, in the last session about how we do also we can envision doing state parameter estimations at the same time. At the beginning, we'll focus on the uh, state. I want I'm looking for the state. Also in the uh, four DVAR problems. We will do some parameters, you will see. OK? So this is just to start from. And this is the uh, problem of assimilation. So uh, what is 3D assimilation? I'll start from 3D. I'll go to uh, 4D. And 3D will give me a very good basis to go to uh, 3D. So what is 3D? I have the ocean state, x, OK? And have an observation of the state, OK? H can be nonlinear. And I want to, what is x if I'm observing, I have the observations y. So in the one way to do it, forget this term, I'm looking for x that is, gets me not very far from y. Okay? And I measure y minus hx, so this is the distance between the observation and my prediction. Okay? And I'm looking for x that makes this distance the smallest possible, according to some weight matrix. The weight matrix, for instance, if the observations are Noisy, I know some data that are uh, less certain or more certain than other data, I can weight this data more. So I want to get closer to these data that are certain than data that are not certain. Now, unfortunately, if I only take the ocean data, you know, we also we start into having some good amount of data. We have satellites, we have in, si in situ data. 
but it's still very underdetermined problem. We don't have enough data for this to find a unique solution. It's underdetermined. I can fit it in many ways. So what we do, we introduce a prior term, a regularization uh, term. And this term is, allows me to make, to find, uh, to make this problem overdetermined and find uh, one solution uh, uh, for x. So, and here, you know, in the assimilation community, we, we take the uh, prior and basically I look for the estimate that is not far from the data and also remain close to some prior, some forecast. So in the, in the ocean atmosphere, we have a forecast now. I look for the solution that is not far from the forecast and I try to fit the observation at the same time. So with these two constraints, the problem becomes uh, uh, overdetermined and I can find uh, a solution. It regularizes the uh, problem. And these are weight uh, matrices. Now, you can develop this. When h is linear, this problem, this function becomes convex, so it has one minimum. And I can compute the derivative of this function and find one minima. So there is a global minima and can explicitly exp uh, express it in this form where this is a model minus data, uh, forecast minus data. This is the innovation. I extrapolate it for the whole space, and then it's an incremental uh, part. I add it to the forecast to correct and get the analysis. So it's a, it's a forecast plus a correction term that comes from the data. OK? Uh, and the question here, important question for a simulation, what are these? Weights. And the other question is, a framework like this does not allow me to compute uncertainties on the estimate. What, my, the, uh, what are my uncertainties? How certain I am with this estimate? One way, other way to look at this problem is to do the uh, blue. Probably you heard about the blue, the best linear unbiased estimator. So here we look at the estimate at the at this ocean state as random. And basically, we allow uncertainties in the background, in the prior, and uncertainties in the uh, observation. So I assume that the data are noisy, and epsilon is a random variable. And this is the truth. And the background is also have some errors that is uh, random as well. And you know, usually it's noted by B background covariance, and they have so the. Uh, R is the observational error covariance, and PB is the uh, uh, prior or background covariance, pri uh, prior error covariance. So now in a linear sense, we call it linear unbiased estimator for a reason, because we look for a linear estimator of the prior and the data. Unbiased means that on average, the average of the error equal to zero. Now, why we look for this, you know, you want an estimate that you want to minimize the, uh, the error with the truth, but you don't know the truth. So instead of looking for an estimate that minimizes the error with the truth, because you don't know the truth, you cannot compute it, you look for an estimate that has some good statistical properties. And good statistical properties is an estimate that is unbiased, the average of the error is zero, and minimum variance. So you know, if you have an estimate and with the uh, with error is, with average of error is zero, it can oscillate a lot, but on average is zero. You want it to oscillate not far from the truth, so you make it minimum uh, variance. So first, you write it linear, then you assume it's unbiased. You uh, force unbiasedness; it becomes of this form forecast plus some correction term from the innovation as we did before. And we make when you as, uh, minimize the variance with some linear algebra, you get this, which is exactly this one. But with the only difference is, you see the difference, the only difference is in the weight matrices. So the weight matrices are basically the, uh, the inverse of the covariances. OK, so this framework allows me to set the weights in a statistical sense. And it makes sense. Because you know, the, if the variance of the error of the, of the data is large, this means the uncertainties on the data is large. I don't want to weight it strongly in the 
optimi uh, optimization. So I need to reduce its weight. And this framework allows me to do that in a very a nice way. Now, this framework is, uh, is works when h is uh, linear, and I get the minimum uh, variance estimate. Now, what if h is non-linear? All this fails. So I go to the Holy uh, equation of uh, Bayesian, Bayesian formulation of the uh, of the estimation problem, where basically I have a data. So I look for the probability. I want to compute the probability of x given the data. I don't like much this uh, notation because it confuses between random variables and uh, samples realizations. But you know, for people who are familiar with that, they will. Uh, I'm sure they will be able to uh, absorb it, simulate it. For the other people, it's a good. I think it's a good way to present it. So basically, I'm looking for probability of x because it's a random variable, given what I observed. And this is the axiom of Bayes' rule, where we call this the posterior. It's equal to the likelihood multiplied by the prior. This is the bias axiom of probability. It's come from probability conditional probability. It's p of a given b. It's p of b given a multiplied by p a divided by p b. So this is the prior, some prior information and distribution. I put it. If I know nothing about the prior, what kind of distribution I can take? If I know nothing about the prior, you know, I take a uniform distribution. It can anything, right? If I have no clue what it could be, I take a uniform distribution. We call it an unformative uh, prior. Okay? And basically, the genius of this is to go from probability of x given y. This is, I'm interested in probability of x, to probability of y given x. So what's the probability of predicting y given x? And this, I get it easily from the observational model y equal h x plus epsilon. Because given x, the probability of y becomes the prob basically the distribution, the translated distribution of the probability of the observational error. OK? If you're not very familiar with this, it's not at the end of the world. But just keep in mind, posterior equal pri uh, likelihood multiplied by uh, prior. Once I have the distribution, OK, because the random variable, I characterize this distribution, I compute any estimate. And the, the, are the two uh, widely used estimates is I can compute the maximum. I look for the maximum of the uh, x given y, so the, uh, the uh, maximum a posterior estimate. Or also, I can look at the minimum variance estimate. If you have a distribution and, you wanna, and I tell you, give me an estimate. I give you, like for instance, it's a Gaussian distribution. What is your best guess? You would bet on what? A Gaussian. I'm sorry? The mean, right? If it's Gaussian, I would bet on the mean. OK, if it's a distribution that have, by models, it has two, between minus one and one, you would bet on what? I'm sorry? Zero is, you know, it's the probability of getting zero is zero. It's very unlikely you'll get zero. It's the worst bet you can make. It's the less risky. On average, it's the less risky. But you're very likely, you're trying to be less risky, but you, you can do better than that. If you have, if you have a, a high mode somewhere, you're more likely to get there. So basically, the maximum of the density is, is a good bet. And this is why we usually look at the maximum a posteriori uh, estimate when the distribution is not Gaussian. OK? So there are different estimates. You can compute estimate, and you can compute also uncertainties on the estimate. Now, if you take this, and we assume you know, we follow Bayes, if the noise is Gaussian, so I have y equal h x plus epsilon and epsilon follow Gaussian distribution, right? So if x is given, p of y given x becomes also Gaussian, okay, normal distribution. And if I assume also my prior is Gaussian, 
So I get also a Gaussian distribution. When I multiply these, we can show that the distribution remains Gaussian. And it's maximized by minimizing this, the sum of this. OK? And if you look at this, it's exactly the, the least square solution or the uh, blue estimators, even when h non linear, and with the observational error covariance as the weight matrices. So this is a general framework for both of them when the distribution of the noise is Gaussian. When it's not, this does not hold anymore, and you get more general uh, solution. OK? And you can compute the estimate, and also you can compute the covariance when h is linear. When h is nonlinear, you can optimize this directly with an optimization algorithm to get to the solution, the maximum a posteriori solution. So least square is computing the maximum a posteriori solution, whether h is linear or not. OK? While the blue is computing the uh, is optimal when h is linear and the noise is Gaussian. If the noise is Gaussian, blue remains the blue. the best linear and bias estimator. What is the distribution is Gaussian or not? Uh, so this is what I was saying here. I can skip this one. So we go to the main, two main approaches we use in data assimilation, optimal interpolation, and 3D var. 3D var is just, you know, you have this cost function, OK? And I'm looking for the maximum a posterior estimate. I run an um, uh, optimization algorithm. And if h linear, it's a, it has a global minima. If h is nonlinear, I hope, hopefully, we'll get to the a good uh, minima, because the cost function is not convex uh, anymore. Optimal interpolations, they try to solve the blue equations directly. So if h linear is fine, if h is nonlinear, I try, we, tr we linearize, and we can even iterate on the uh, linearization. So there are these two uh, communities. These came from more statistical background. These came from the optimization, variational people background. And basically, more or less, they are solving the same thing in different uh, uh, ways. This is with optimization. This is trying to invert directly and compute uh, t blue. Last slide about uh, 3D var. It's a very important part is the PB, is the background covariance. And this is because, you know, if you put this as one vector z, you basically only updating the update of xa is only done in the direction of PB. Okay, this is a subspace where the update with the data is where the data is propag you know is extrapolated. So PB is very important. It's crucial to get a good background to spread the data uh, around. And very, you know, uh, I will just show this slide very quickly. A popular way to do it in the variational community is to make a covariance, statistical covariance, but include some dynamics here. And the goal to get some dynamics is you don't want, you want to spread the data in a dynamical way. So when you put it in the model, and integrate later on, the model will be able to assimilate it. This is the word assimilation. This is why we use the word assimilation. Can the, wo so the model assimilate this information or not? So you better have, it's very good to have some dynamics in here. And this is what this matrix L uh, operator allows you uh, to do. By doing this, uh, now you can do these kind of things in the uh, 3D var approach because you're using optimization and you can avoid inverting this matrix. It's very difficult to do these, such a things in optimal interpolation. In optimal interpolation, they do some statistical or low rank uh, covariances, but it's difficult to do, to include some, some dynamics in the uh, solution. Lately, it's becoming very popular to use some ensembles to make also an estimate of background or a combination uh, of these. A good, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the chapter, I'll put some good, very good references. There are very good discussions on how to choose the L, what kind of dynamics you need, like geostrophy or others, to enforce in your solution. Otherwise, your ocean model will not like it, and it will be an issue in the uh, forecast. So what to keep in mind in this uh, first part, 
the Bayesian framework, I look at it as the as the top. It's designed for nonlinear and non-Gaussian estimation, and it provides an approach for not only the estimate but any moment, any any uh, uncertainties on uh, the uncertainties on the estimate. When H is linear, we get the blue. The blue is the optimal one. When the error is Gaussian, one not it is the best among linear estimators. You can still compute it, and it's still the best among linear estimators. 3D var computes the, ma the map, the best estimate, the solution, not the uncertainties around it, uh, when the errors are Gaussian. When not, it's a least square approach. I'm close to the data, close to the uh, prior. But supposedly, we can do better if you solve the vision directly. You must have probably heard about MCMC. When you don't have Gaussian noise, it becomes difficult. You don't have a cost function, and you need to do MCMC that is really, really expensive uh, to solve. And there is a lot of research on how to do uh, that. As I discussed, you know, 3D var allowed, allows more sophisticated ways to formulate, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to, in to include more sophisticated backgrounds than optimal interpolation. And modeling B, BB, or B background covariance is really uh, crucial for all these approaches because this is where the the matrix that is extrapolating all the information from uh, the information from the observations, and this is why we go to for the assimilation in such a way to either reduce dependence or PB or give me a way to model PB uh, from the dynamics of the model uh, directly. Okay, so this is the ta takeaway message from this first uh, 3D assimilation. It comes from Bayesian, and I will later on derive everything from here. So I will derive 4D var now from this, uh, uh, from here now. And I think I'm done in this one. OK, so let me open the 4D var. OK, sorry. You're not supposed to see that. OK, here you go. OK. So let's do 4D assimilation. The idea of 4D assimilation is to include more data and more information in the estimation process. Right now, I have data, but it's not enough. So I want to include more. So I'll start with the vision uh, formulation of the problem. And this will allow me to go to 4D var. And you'll see where 4D var comes. And then later, from tomorrow, I'll start doing the vision filtering, which is solving. You'll see the equivalence between these two directly and where these come from. OK, so the problem now, I have time included. So I have data and time. And I want to estimate the state at given window over a window of time, over a period of time, given all the data available in this time. So I write the same thing. I write the probability distribution of all the state given all the data. OK? And I use Bayes. If you don't want to follow all these, that's fine. But basically, I'm just doing Bayes where I have all the states, all the data, and one vector. OK, I put them all at the same time. I use assumptions. I assume that the errors are independent and they are Gaussian. So I get the, all these posterior likelihood and the background. And the nice thing about it, it ends up as a function of this. So maximizing this is, again, minimizing this objective function. OK? I'll skip these. I just wanted to show you that based on this, I come up with this objective function that if I want to compute the map, I need to minimize this function. So what's this function? This is the prior term, as in the 3D. This is more than minus data, OK? But over time, so I'm adding all models minus data over time. So I'm conditioning my, my model over all the data. And there is another term that comes from the model error. I'm looking for this to be minimal, as I'm constraining it in the cost function. Now, if I want to solve this, imagine I have 10 to the 8 dimension. OK, and I'm looking for all the x's. If I'm looking for a large window, the dimension of the optimization space will be horrible, will be too large. Because you know, assuming I have from x1 to x100, I have 10 to the 8 multiplying by 100. The problem becomes very, very 
large. The other thing, I know very badly this model error covariance. So one way to deal with the problem, assume perfect model. My model is perfect. The models will be laughing at us, but it's a perfect model. If I know now, I can predict tomorrow perfectly. So this term goes to zero. So all I'm looking for now is to know what's happening at the initial time. If I know what's happening at the initial time, all I need to do is unleash my model to make my forecast. So instead of estimating all the states from x0 to xn, I only need to estimate x0. So the optimization is only over uh, x0. So what's going on? I have space times model trajectory. So this is the true tra trajectory of the, uh, of the ocean model. These are some data collected, OK? I have some initial conditions. And based on my initial conditions, if I run my model, I get this. The question is, I'm looking for a new initial conditions that when I run it, it allows me to fit my model to the data. OK? So basically, the only unknown is the initial condition. And I'm looking for this initial condition that fits the uh, data. And this is what we call for DVAR, strong constraint for DVAR. OK, strong because there is no model error in there. Now there are, so this is, of course, the assimilation period, and this is the forecast uh, period. Now there are techniques, we call them weak constraint for DVAR. And what they do, they try to look for the initial condition, or actually, basi basically all the, uh, all the state of the ocean over the period of time. So they look for the initial conditions and the model errors. It's the same thing uh, that minimize this cost function. Now, in a linear setting, if you put all the data in one vector and you put all the controls, all the unknowns in one vector, you can write it as a 3D var uh, problem. Now, the nice thing about this writing it this way is that no matter what is the size of this control or this unknowns, the, the inversion is done in the observation space. So you have fixed number of observations. Okay, No matter how big is this vector, you don't care because you're only inverting in the observation space. So they turn the inversion in the observation space, and uh, they update all their control. Now, one trick in there is, and there is the representer method, the dual method, that uh, very nicely attacks this problem from a linearization point of view, because you need to linearize to write it this way. A big problem is this matrix here is the model error covariance because it's like, you know, it's really, it's very powerful. You can fit anything with it. You have a model error at every time step. So you can fit any data with it. And this could be a little bit dangerous, you know, overfitting for the wrong reason is dangerous. So they spend a lot of time smoothing these model errors so that they don't uh, uh, overfit. Okay, we will f we'll focus on the not the strong constraint, not the weak constraint, what I call in between, but for me it's a it's really a weak constraint. It's a, it's a smart weak constraint. You can not only with this approach estimate, let's say, the initial condition, but you can estimate also you can control or you can adjust any unknown properties in the uh, ocean model, like initial conditions, forcing, you know, you can also boundaries, I'll show you examples. So basically the question is what are the initial conditions, what are the atmospheric forcings that allow me to fit my model to all this data over time? Okay? So it's like, you know, you're, you're, it's, a, it's a smart dynamical parameterization of the model error. I know there are errors in the initial conditions. I know there are errors in the boundaries. I know there are uncertainties in the viscosity diffusivity. I can control all these. Okay? What are all these parameters that fit my model to the data? So it's at some kind of dynamical uh, uh, parameterization of the model error is kind of, you know, is not strong, there is no model error. Weak is, there is model error every time step, additive model error. There is no reason why we put additive, by the way. Okay? This is one way to tackle uh, model errors, and this is what the ECHO and ROMS group did in a very nice uh, way. So once we write this, the nice thing about it, we get a dynamically consistent solution. So my solution is, once I get the forcing initial conditions, I write my model, and my output is 
model output. So it's dynamically consistent. And physicists like this, like this thing. It's a map, but very difficult to uh, estimate the uncertainties around my estimate. When the model is nonlinear, this can become very uh, non-convex. And actually, when it's strongly nonlinear, it can become very nasty, and it's very difficult to optimize. I'll give a very quick example. Uh, and uh, we require an optimization program uh, algorithm, of course, and to define the background covariance. Probably you heard about it. The adjunct method is just a way to compute the gradients of, uh, uh, of the cost function. Because computing the gradients of the cost function can be, uh, it's not an easy task. We use, you know, as the adjunct method is just based on the composite derivatives of a function. Because you have m0, m1, mk. Uh, and then when you derive it, you get the transpose of these. So you can write the gradients. And instead of computing the gradients directly, you can solve it. You can compute them using what we call the adjunct method, which, come, which is exactly solving this thing, but the gradient, but backward uh, in time. So it's a very convenient, very efficient way to compute the gradient of G with respect to Z, to the, of the cost function with the respect to the unknown. So you have forward and you have backward. You get the gradient. You put it on optimization algorithm, and you optimize. So quickly, oh, how uh, you know with the adjunct, has, how the adjunct uh, uh, method uh, works? We start from an initial guess. While you have the gradient is still significant, it's not going to zero. We compute the forward, then we compute the backward to get the sensitivities, the gradients. When we have the gradients, we do a gradient-based decent optimization. We like gradient-decent optimization because uh, they have fast conversion rates. They converge very quickly uh, compared to other global optimization methods. And you know, in the example I'll show you. You know, you need to to save all the backward trajectory, and this can be very expensive. So we do checkpointing, and so one backward is like four times uh, forward, at least in the MIT GCM uh, setting. Okay, I'll go very quickly. This is I have two examples to show you. This is the Echo One degree. I'm not sure if you heard about Echo. It's the uh, consortium between MIT, GPL, and Scripps five, ten years ago. It's still running, uh, mainly now between MIT and uh, JPL. They started from one degree, degree global model, ocean model. They want to assimilate everything in the ocean over 30 years, 40 years, and make one dynamically consistent solution uh, that's fitting all the data at the same time. And for that, they control the initial condition and the atmospheric forcing. Based on that, they have a solution, 50 years of reanalysis, only one big optimization at one uh, degree. And it looks quite good when you compare you know, they were able, this is the mean sea surface temperature from TMI, this is the mean surface temperature from ECHO at one degree, this is the sea surface height, so they can fit the large scale very nicely. I'll go very quickly in the rest. When I went to Scripps in 2002, my job was about doing at high resolution one six of degree for the tropical Pacific. So when we looked at the solution uh, from the ECHO, you know, this is the equatorial undercurrent, it wasn't well uh, results, so we decided to do our own optimization in the Pacific. Uh, so what we did, we took the tropical Pacific, and now we contro control forcing, but, but also we can control, adjust what's happening at the boundaries in order to fit all the data at the same time. And uh, so we built a regional MIT GCM data. We collected all the data in the Pacific, sea surface height, sea surface temperature, all the profiles. We can, something in the nice in the um, in the adjoint is that you can also assimilate climatologies. You can constrain the mean of your model to the mean of the climatology, so it doesn't drift. So we put all these, and this is a, an example of the cost function we have of all the terms model minus data. Okay, this is a model data term, and then we controlled initial condition, atmospheric forcing, and boundaries, and this is how they look as well. So you can put also some smoothing terms on the forcing. You want it to be smooth, so you can constrain unsmoothness, basically, with the Laplacian. And we run the adjoint for this. And what we found was interesting. When you run the adjoint over one year, when, uh, this is after two months, you start seeing these 
strong, uh, crazy things. And if you run it more, the uh, sensitivity starts to increase and increase, and you get to nuns, and the adjoint will blow up. So, and this was going on. Actually, it's a well-known problem in the uh, in the atmospheric community. In the atmospheric community, they can they run a couple of days before the adjoint uh, joint blows up because it's more chaotic. So, what's happening in the forward model? It's very it's a chaotic model, but it has nonlinearities. So, any instabilities can be controlled by the nonlinearities. When you run the adjoint, it's linear, and what's uh, when it's linear, if there is an instability, it can grow, and no one can. Uh, uh, stop it. And this is what happens with the adjunct. So basically what you're dealing with, instead of have having a cost function that looks, you know, like this, you're having a cost function that looks really crazy. This is an example of from uh, Cole and Willebrand, where over time the sensitivities of the adjunct just grow exponentially uh, in time. And this is how the cost function looks like. It starts to become very, very nasty, but the longer the window, the more regularize the cost function, but inside it's very wiggly. And if you have this and you use a gradient based optimization, forget it, you can get nowhere with the optimization. So you have to try to avoid this. And what we did is just we ran with higher. So either you, you run where the adjunct is stable, where you don't have exponentially growth, you do the assimilation cyclic, this is what we do. Or if we want a dynamically consistent solution, you have to damp these. High, uh, uh, these high, uh, very fast scales, small scales, and we did it with high viscosity and diffusivity in the work backward. So let me show you what we get if we run with the regular viscosity and diffusivity. We can run around two to, two to three months before this blows up. If we run with ten times the viscosity, we smooth it. But in order to smooth over one or you know over ten years, we had to go to thirty times viscosity and diffusivity. But then you start seeing when you put too much viscosity and diffusivity, you start losing on the large scales. You're not only damping the small scales, you're damping the large scales. With that, you can optimize, you can decrease the cost function. But you know, we're doing, you know, it's one way to deal with it. But if it's, you have a very large window, you're losing on the uh, large scale. But you have to do something to get rid of these fast scales and remove them from the adjoint. Otherwise, you will not be able to uh, go down. This is how the cost function decreases. You know, we can we are able to fit all the data. These are the model data, the data terms. These are the control terms. Uh, this is how we look compared to sea surface temperature. This is how we look for the uh, zonal velocities. We start getting it uh, very well. We are able to fit them dynamically in a very nice way. This is the sea surface temperature from TMI. Uh, with the assimilation, we get very nicely also the large scales of the sea uh, surface height. I had as a slide to talk about uh, the last slide about reduced 4 var methods. And basically what we do just quickly is to reduce the dimension of, of the control, because the control is very large, so with optimization can go faster. Or we start playing with the adjoint uh, itself. Either we do a reduced order modeling, or we do a reduced adjoint while keeping the forward model. So all these methods is Basically, I'm trying to avoid building the adjoint. Building the adjoint can take a lot of time. It's a very intrusive method, and this is why people have to think twice before they get it. The nice thing about it is that it gives you a dynamically consistent uh, solution, and some physicists care a lot about uh, this. So this is the last slide on this talk. What are the advantages? It's computer dynamically consistent solution, can accommodate various dynamics and smoothing constraints and also can assimilate averages, standard deviation. You can assimilate any statistical qu quantity because you're assimilating over a window. And so it's very suitable for reanalysis. It's intrusive. It requires an adjoint. And building an adjoint is really uh, a difficult problem, uh, you know, uh, very demanding. It has issues with strong linearity, so we have to reduce the window. And the issue when you reduce the window, you need the new background for the next step. And your background is not updated. Uh, also, you know, how to separate the, uh, you know, when you invert, if you have errors in the model, it can be reflected in errors in the controls you're doing. So basically, like for instance, if you look at the echo, one degree, you will see that the forcing over the northern Pacific, that the wind became very strong because the northern equatorial current 
was weak. So what uh, adjoint did, what the uh, four divar did, it made the wind very strong to force a stronger NEC. Uh, so you have to be very careful, and the the covariance matrices of the adjusted variables need to be chosen in a uh, nice way, which is not uh, which, uh, very carefully, which is not an easy thing. And last thing is it is iterative. So optimization in one after the other. You have to wait for one to go to the other one. So not very easily parallelizable. They are work on it on ECMWF, but it's still, you know, it's not, it's not, I don't see how they will do something like this. You have to wait for one iteration to get to the other. Okay? So these are what I wanted to get from uh, for DVAR for this uh, part. If you have any questions, sorry, I went over time. We can discuss it over uh, later on, instead, you know, outside the pool. Thank you.